Hi everyone and welcome to our workshop using rubrics for assessment. Uh, assessment essentially is the process of gathering data. More specifically, assessment is the way that instructors gather data about their teaching, about their students' learning. And the data provide a picture of a range of activities using different forms of assessment like pretests, observations, examinations, etc. So once those data are, are gathered, the instructor can then evaluate them. So evaluation draws on your judgment to determine the overall value of an outcome based on the assessment data. It's in the decision making process then where we design ways to improve the recognized students' weaknesses, gaps, or deficiencies. So assessment can really help us uh, identify problem areas and then fix them before the end of the semester. My name is Amanda Smothers. I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator um, in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning, or CITL. Um, and I'm also helping out with the duties of the Online Learning Coordinator at the moment as well. I earned my PhD in English from NIU in 2016, and I've been teaching college English for about 13 years. I teach a combination of face-to-face -face hybrid and online courses at community colleges, uh, as well as uh, a four-year college, and I also am teaching UNIV 595 online at NIU uh, last semester and this semester. So I teach students with a wide range of ages and experiences, and I'm a big fan of rubrics, and I use them for most assignments, particularly with online teaching. So let's get to know you as well. What's your your name? It should be, you should have entered your name when you um, logged in today, but if you didn't, then you can add it there to the chat. Um, what's your role, division department? You can also add what you're hoping to get out of today's session as well. So you can either post it to the chat, which is really fine. You can use your microphone if you want to. That is fine as well. I'll use the microphone. Uh, my name is Mike. Ad <laughs> my, my name is Mike Adzevec. I work in the Division of University uh, Advancement. I do fundraising work, but I'm teaching for the first time this semester um, um, a philanthropy and fundraising class. So I'm just looking to do sort of a fly on the wall. I'm coming in with zero rubric experience, but um, creating assignments. So I'd love to know just more about uh, how this plays into the whole the whole picture. Great. Well, thank you, Mike, and uh, welcome to teaching. Thanks. All right. So we have um, some different disciplines here. We've got industrial and systems engineering, um, music, uh, nonprofit NGO studies, uh, some people who are new to rubrics, some who uh, are already using them but just want more uh, enhancement of skills, uh, sociology we have. Um, higher education and student affairs, ETRA, nursing, great. Um, and then we have uh, someone who wants to learn how to develop them, uh, learn how to develop rubrics um, because they use them, the ones that are developed by a professor, so that's great. Okay, excellent. So we've got a wide range of experiences um, and a range of different disciplines as well. Okay, a doc student in NASA. All right, so our agenda for today is just basically to look at different types of rubric definitions. There's multiple types of rubrics. Um, so we'll look at what the different options are and then we'll kind of go from there. Uh, and then we'll look at rubric components. So what are the parts of a rubric, uh, how to develop a rubric, and then um, I'll give you guys some resources as well at the end. We won't have hands-on practice creating rubrics in today's session, but I will send you resources after today that give you some examples of rubrics. Um, I definitely recommend not reinventing the wheel if you're just starting off with rubrics. So find a rubric that's already been made on, uh, you know, something, an assignment assessment that's close to the assessment that you want to use it for, and then edit it to tailor it to meet your needs. Um, 
because rubric making can be a very um, time consuming process, especially if you're creating an analytic rubric with a lot of descriptors. So definitely don't have to reinvent the wheel. So I just wanted to, and some of you have already shared your experience with rubrics, um, but just take a, a minute to reflect on your experience. Um, if you haven't used a rubric, that's totally fine. If you have used rubrics, how have you used them? Um, or if you haven't used them, if you're, for example, a, um, a doctoral student or a GA, TA, um, have you been assessed using rubrics? How do you feel about rubrics? Um, so, you know, any of these questions that you want to answer, you don't have to answer all of them. But just, you know, kind of pick one that speaks to you and then you can answer that question in the chat or you can share your audio. So I'll, I'll pop on because I both teach and I'm a doc student. As a student, I love having a rubric because it tells me exactly, <laughs> exactly what to do. But I'll say, as an instructor, I like having basic rubrics. But on the other hand, I feel like then sometimes it takes away our students' ability sometimes to be creative. So I, I feel like sometimes they just answer the letter of the rubric, not, mm -hmm. um, not think outside that. So mm -hmm. I don't know. That That's one of the things I'm hoping to learn today is just how do we, maybe I'm just my rubrics just aren't as good as they could be. Yes, I found that too. And um, one of the things that I've done is uh, so I don't use like very good, good, you know, as my descriptors, I use like exemplary, proficient, um, something that may be a little bit more descriptive of the level of performance um, I'm expecting from students. But one of the things that I like to do on the highest level of performance is add in maybe a little bit of that flexibility and that creativity. So some just it, something, a descriptor that um, explains that students maybe go above and beyond in some sort of way. So that kind of leaves it open. Um, so they can't really get that highest A unless they maybe go above and beyond in some way. Um, so we've got some other comments here too in the chat. Um, but rubrics is a time saver, um, using rubrics for years, uh, love rubrics as a student, uh, because it does state, you know, what's expected of students. Um, oh, some can find them limiting for students as well. So we've got some consensus there. Any other comments? Okay, so great. So we've got a range of perspectives there. Uh, so it does make grading easy for sure. It makes it a, a lot less time consuming um, if you can, you know, kind of check boxes on a rubric. And if you've got effective descriptors of what students performance look like then you know that's also informative for students and it avoids you having to repeat um comments as well so here's just a few questions that um, you might want to consider as you prepare to assess student work so first what are the attributes of quality performance on the task so what what does quality performance look like on whatever task you're assessing so in other words, which qualities or features would demonstrate whether students have produced an exemplary response to the task? Um, and what do you expect to see if this task is completed proficiently or just adequately or deficiently? Do you have models of student work that exemplify the criteria you'll use to assess this task that might help you uh, articulate by looking at those examples of student work, articulate what it is about each one um, each example that is proficient, that's adequate, that's deficient, that's exemplary. And rubrics can help you answer these questions as well. Uh, and Mary brings up a good point that it, the rubrics can make it easier to equally apply standards to all students. And we'll get to some of the, the pros and cons of rubrics in just a minute. Oops, 
went too far. So what is a rubric? A rubric is an assessment tool. Um, it's just a tool that we use. It's a systematic scoring guide. Uh, it's an inst instructional guide as well. It shows students how they're going to be assessed. Um, it gives them information that they need before they start an assignment on how they're what, what's going to be expected of them in the performance of that assignment. Um, so it's an explicit, explicit set of criteria used for assessing a specific type of work or performance. What can rubrics accomplish? What can they do? In other words, rubrics can help us set anchor points along a quality continuum so we can set reasonable and appropriate expectations for students and so we can consistently judge how well they've met them. Um, as Mary said, you know, apply those standards um, to all students. And then rubrics also divide an assignment into its component parts and provide a detailed description of what constitutes acceptable and unacceptable levels of performance for each of those parts. So it shows students how they can succeed on an assessment. So here are some potential benefits of rubrics. Um, they assess complex and subjective criteria and make the assessment of that criteria maybe a little bit more objective. Um, they evaluate performance. They provide for precise uh, and more accurate judgment. They provide a common format for stating criteria and standards. They inform students of those criteria on which they'll be graded um, and how they can succeed. And they document and communicate the grading pro uh, process to students. So there are some potential drawbacks. Um, there are times also um, that you might need to be subjective when assessing student performance outcomes or projects. So, um, you know, there are some subjects or some aspects of an assessment that may be difficult to be completely objective on. Um, so some potential drawbacks, it may obscure subjectivity. So it may make it seem maybe to us and to students like uh, our assessment or um, our um, evaluation of a student's work is more objective than it is. Um, we created that rubric. We wrote those descriptors. Uh, and so, you know, it may have the more of the veil of uh, objectivity um, and lull us into a false or sense of security of uh, whether something is objective or subjective. Um, so there is always going to be some subjectivity. We choose the criteria. We choose how we're assessing that criteria. Um, also, it could drive instruction. So we don't want to necessarily teach, quote unquote, to the test. Um, so we want to be careful um, that we're not doing that because of our rubric. Um, that also might standardize how st instructors think about student performance, and that could be a good thing. It could also be a drawback um, in not allowing for maybe some individuality and creativity there. And that's all also in how you uh, set up your rubric and how you choose to write those descriptors. Um, it also, as was brought up, may lead toward predictive performance, uh, so students kind of checking things off of a list um, and just doing, you know, those basic things um, and not getting a whole lot of variation among students' work. Uh, and it could limit student creativity. But again, that all just depends on the type of rubric that you use and how you use it. So there is a difference between a checklist and a rubric. A checklist is mostly yes and no, absolutes. Um, you usually, usually use checklists when introducing a basic skill or a process. Uh, there's no real judgment on work quality with a checklist. It's just kind of an it's there or it's not uh, type of thing. Um, it doesn't indicate student understanding or mastering of information or skill, and it doesn't provide your detailed performance feedback. Rubrics have a little bit more nuance. They're not necessarily black and white. There's levels, uh, some shades of gray there. We use it when assessing student learning. So we want to find out whether students are meeting those outcomes that we want them to meet. Uh, evaluates the quality of work based on specific criteria. 
indicates whether students have mastered the content, and it also provides detailed feedback on performance, especially with those descriptors there. Um, and then you can also, in addition to using rubric, provide some uh, other comments, some individualized comments to students as well, just to enhance that feedback. There are multiple parts of a rubric. Um, each part's important, but it contributes to the whole. Rubrics can be used to assess a lot of different things, certain features of an oral presentation. It can be used to assess a written report, a musical performance, math problem solving, a case study. You know, it goes on and on and on. If there's an assessment, it can probably be assessed using a rubric. Um, so the different components of a rubric, there's a task description so that involves the performance, the product, or the outcome. There are criteria, um, so individual criterion, trait, a feature, a dimension, a slice of whatever they're, they're being um, evaluated on. There are levels of performance. You want to provide at least two, preferably more, but more is not always um, better. So there's a certain kind of sweet spot of levels of performance. Um, I usually try to go between three and five, no more than five, no fewer than three. That's my personal preference. Um, when you get too many levels of performance, it becomes very difficult to distinguish between levels of performance and to write those descriptors uh, because the line between them, it becomes more blurred uh, and thinner. There are also descriptors in a rubric that describes the levels, the gradations of performance on each individual criteria. There are scores, so it's a value to rate each criterion and a weighting factor. You can give more value to one criterion than another, um, or you don't have to. You don't have to weight uh, the, the values. You can have them all be worth the exact same if you want. So this is an excerpt from a rubric I've used to grade an essay assignment. This particular essay rubric had six criteria, purpose, research, content development, organization, formatting, and mechanics. So obviously I can't fit the whole thing on here, nor do I want to. <laughs> um, but I've, I've given you the first couple here so you can see the basic format of a rubric. Um, the criteria are along the left column of the rubric. Those are the items on which students will be assessed. So in this example, purpose and research. Level of performance appears across the top of the rubric. Those are the degrees to which students have mastered the criteria. And you can customize what you call those levels of performance. Um, but you might also want to include maybe definitions of what you mean by those terms in a blurb somewhere in the course or on the rubric itself. Um, and it makes sense to do it just somewhere in the course uh, on Blackboard or in the syllabus if you're going to be using that same terminology for all of your rubrics. So for example, uh, I might want to explain that proficient means that the student has demonstrated an expert level of performance in the criteria, whereas competent uh, means that the student has demonstrated an acceptable but not superior level of performance. Um, but you can use whatever terminology you want as long as you explain it and it's clear to students. Descriptors appear in the other boxes of the rubric. These are descriptions of what student writing, in this case because this is a writing assignment, what student writing looks like under each criteria and for each level of performance. So you can see in this example rubric that I've explained what student work should look like if it earned a proficient score for research. And this description is different than the descriptors for competent, developing, and novel, uh, novice levels of performance for research. There are pros and cons to writing lengthy or detailed descriptors. A pro might be that it may make grading easier or quicker because you could leave fewer comments uh, before they've completed the assessment. Detailed descriptors also help communicate to students what they need to do to earn their desired grade. So it might result in better student performance in the task as well. A uh, con might be that it takes longer to write those detailed descriptors. Um, however, once you've written them, you may only need to tweak them or edit them from semester to semester rather than just starting completely over from scratch. And you might find that if your descriptors are too detailed and use absolutes, uh, you may box yourself into grades that you don't feel are necessarily appropriate for a given student's performance. 
So that's why I started using, started using the word may throughout my rubrics. They may do this, it may do that. And it creates more nuance when grading and then I can leave comments that further explain that score to students as well. The scores for each criteria and performance level can also be listed in the rubric. Um, they will be attached to the rubric if you're using a, an interactive rubric on Blackboard. Um, you can fill those in there. If you're creating a rubric um, using Blackboard's rubric tool, you'll have a, a few options for how you want to set up your rubric. And those options will vary depending on whether you're using original course view or ultra course view. Um, and you'll want to keep in mind that the points value should be appropriate for each level and should emphasize the criteria that you want to prioritize over others. So um, that's where that weighting comes in, the weight, weighted grade. So for example, research on this rubric is more important uh, than using MLA formatting. So I would assign formatting lower point values than research. You might also choose not to weight your grades and you can just assign points consistently or percentages consistently based on the level of performance. So everything is worth, each criteria is worth this, the, exactly the same. Um, you could use just a single point value for each level of performance. You can use a point range or a per percentage range um, and your options will vary uh, for interactive rubrics depending on whether you're in original or ultra course view as well. So as I mentioned, you can choose to weight your grades instead of assigning point values. Um, it's easier using Blackboard rubrics because grades will automatically be calculated for you as you click on the descriptor boxes while you're grading assignments. And then once you've filled out the entire rubric for a student's assignment that, that it's attached to, then you click submit and it will automatically export that grade to the, the uh, grade center, which is very nice. Um, Basically, you can use point values to weight your grades or you can use percentages like you see on this slide. When you're using percentages, all the criteria percentages should add up to 100%. So for this rubric, purpose is worth 10%, research is worth 20%, so the other four criteria combined would have a total of the other 70% of the assignment grade. The levels of performance should range from zero to 100% or 100% down to 0%. I like putting the higher points values first because you tend to read from left to right, and I prefer to emphasize what excellent work looks like rather than start with what poor work looks like on my uh, rubric. So that's why I do that. Um, so these percentages tell us two things. One, what grade the student will receive on each criteria, and two, what level of performance the student has earned overall. So in other words, the student can earn a 90% 90 for, 90 for purpose, which means that she or he performed at a proficient level for that criterion. Uh, and the way that that's factored into the overall grade is as 90% of that 10% that the criteria purpose comprises of the whole assignment grade, if that's not too confusing. Um, the levels of performance can also tell students their overall performance level. So when you have the same percentages set up across criteria, um, Thus, if a student earns like an 88% in the entire assignment, she's performed at a competent level overall. So next we'll discuss what task analysis is. Task analysis is when you break the assignment or task into its unique components um, or unique aspects or dimensions. So you start with something that you want to assess, consider its features and determine how to represent those features in your rubric. The rubric should address all aspects of the outcomes being measured and shouldn't address anything extraneous. So for example, spelling and grammar might be considered extraneous on a science assessment unless you plan to measure an outcome that deals specifically with spelling and grammar for that assessment. So make sure that whatever criteria um, you include in your rubric, it is relevant to uh, the task at hand as well as the course too. Um, if the assignment needs to or the assessment needs to address critical thinking skills, does the rubric reflect that? Uh, which of your course outcomes does the rubric address? And are those elements being assessed in the rubric? 
So a criterion is a feature that you want to measure to judge student performance. We usually derive criteria from assignment prompts, from grading sheets, checklists, anything else that we use to help students prepare for that assessment. But you want to keep the number of criteria manageable for you and for students. Too many criteria might signal that the assessments may be trying to do too much. Um, you might have more criteria for you know, a culminating assessment at the end of uh, a, a semester or uh, at the end of a program. But um, you want to typically, for normal assessments throughout the semester, keep that list of criteria manageable. Um, it might be confusing for students if there are too many criteria um, or too many levels of performance, and it would be very time consuming for you to develop, develop and use for grading. So determine exactly what you want to assess, which should be tied to your course objectives, and how you're going to assess it using this particular assignment, and then you can create an effective rubric. Um, so if you find that you have maybe an unmanageable amount of criteria, consider whether you know other criteria are going to be assessed in other assessments, and maybe you can leave those off of this assessment and assess you know, other things for this one and leave the assessment of those criteria uh, for elsewhere. So some ways that criteria may change based on the type of assessment being conducted. Um, in an electronic presentation, you might have technical quality, aesthetics or design, visuals, writing mechanics. For a written paper, you might have criteria like content, organization, thesis, writing conventions. Whereas in a musical performance, it might be steadiness, breathing, appropriate instrument usage, interpretation, accuracy. Um, so the criteria is really going to change based on the type of assessment that you are using. Levels of performance uh, use adjectives to describe the degrees of mastery. So for example, exemplary, proficient, competent, uh, acceptable, satisfactory, developing, novice. Determine the number of levels necessary to assess distinctions of performance. Begin with fewer and move to more if you need them. Uh, the more labels on a rubric, the more difficult it might be to differentiate between them, as I've mentioned, and to articulate precisely why, why one student's work falls into the scale level that it does. Um, as I mentioned before, I would recommend no more than five levels of performance. I find that after five levels, uh, you know, those lines between levels of performance get blurred. Labels may also influence interpretations of performance level. So in addition to better communicating your expectations, those levels of performance permit you to more consistently um, and more objectively distinguish between acceptable and unacceptable performance or between exemplary, satisfactory, novice performance when evaluating your student's work. Labels can be used with or without descriptors. Um, but adding those descriptors can cut down on the amount of written feedback that you need to provide. But it could also necessitate a little bit of clarification of performance on a criteria when a student's work doesn't match the descriptor exactly. So you might need a little bit of clarification, but probably a lot less um, commentary than you would need without descriptors. So you can personalize your labels as long as you explain what they mean, as I've mentioned. Um, so here's an example of such an explanation using a table, or you could just, you know, have a list, bullet pointed list of the performance levels with an explanation afterward, um, or write it out in sentence format. You don't have to include this information on every rubric. It might just suffice it to include it somewhere on Blackboard or in the syllabus grading section. Um, so we've got exemplary, that's outstanding work that goes beyond minimum expectations. Proficient is satisfactory work that meets minimum expectations. Uh, developing work that falls slightly below. And novice, unacceptable work that doesn't meet most or all expectations. Um, and of course, you can label however you want. You can write your explanations however you want, and they can be very different than this. Just an example. So again, descriptors, they spell out each level of performance for each criterion. They describe what performance at each level looks like. They tell students how their work is going to be assessed. 
They help you distinguish between levels of student work. And you can't omit them, but they do aid in some ob objectivity when they're designed well. Descriptors or descriptions should contain, at the very least, a description of the highest level of performance. Um, and then including only that highest level performance descriptors there and not including descriptors in the rest of the, gra uh, the grid uh, would be called a scoring guide. So again, descriptors are articulating what you mean by your labels for each level of performance and each uh, for each criteria. Here's another example. Um, just a bare bones example of a weighted rubric that hasn't been filled in with descriptors yet. Um, so again, you could weight various dimensions according to their significance. To do this, you'd add those descriptors to identify what performance would look like in each criteria for each level. But so for this one, number of sources is worth 15% of the students grade on the assessment, historical accuracy is 40%, organization 30, bibliography 15. And it's whatever you want to prioritize there. So when you're developing scores for your rubric, you want to ask yourself how many points are needed to describe adequately the range of performance that I'm seeking in my students' work. Scores are a system of numbers or values that we use to rate criteria. They can be quantitative, qualitative, or a combination. Um, consider the range of possible performance levels, so high to low or low to high. I mentioned that I prefer placing the higher grades first, but it's up to you. Um, and then you would divide those into levels of performance. A five-point scale might apply A through F grading. The middle number could gravitate to the mean. You could use a separate scale for each criterion um, if you want to weight the grades. Uh, but make sure to define what scores are going to align with ch checklist items on your rubric. Associate points values or define what performance levels are based on the checklist of criteria presence. Uh, and think of scores or the scale as part of a continuum of quality. And I like to, um, especially when I was doing the uh, scoring on my own and in some learning management systems, they don't have weighted, uh, the weighted option that they do in Blackboard uh, original courses uh, for interactive rubrics. And so I have to calculate the weights on my own. And so, then I like to kind of do a little bit of testing, like what if someone got these um, levels of performance for the criteria, what would the grade be, just to kind of double check my math there and make sure that I'm not overinflating um, grades based on level of performance uh, or under, um, you know, uh, giving students too few of points for that. Because a uh, I hate when I go through and I start grading student assignments and then I find out that I've made a mistake on my weights or my points for a rubric and then I have to fix that. So there's different types of rubrics. Um, there's holistic, analytic, task specific, and general. Analytic is the, are the ones that we've been looking at. Um, Thus far, holistic provides an overall assessment with a single scale of performance, while analytic assesses separate attributes, criteria, dimensions across performance levels, as we've been looking at so far. Task-specific rubrics measures one unique task, and then a general rubric measures criteria that are general across tasks. So you might use that general rubric for multiple assessments task specific assessments. So this is what an analytic rubric looks like. Most rubrics are analytic rubrics. Um, an analytic rubric articulates those levels of performance for each criterion so you can assess student performance on each criterion. These types of rubrics are useful for complex performances, uh, skills and projects with multiple, multiple criteria or dimensions. They judge specific criteria separately. It provides a separate score for each criterion, which helps with weighting scores, and it reveals strengths and weaknesses in performance. It can also be used for students to self-assess understanding your performance, um, and it may take a little bit more time to score using an analytic rubric than other types of rubrics, which we'll see why that is. So again, here's that same rubric that I showed you before for weighted grades. Um, Using a history report analytic rubric, for example, you could assess how well a student did on organization of the essay, 
and distinguish that from how well the student performed on historical accuracy. You would use analytic rubrics as student performance increasingly varies across criteria, and they're especially helpful for essays, term papers, that type of thing. Um, holistic rubric is very different. It means to treat the whole rather than its parts. A holistic rubric, in contrast to an analytic rubric, does not list separate levels of performance for each criterion. Instead, it assigns a level of performance by assessing performance across multiple criteria as a whole. And we'll see an example. Holistic rubrics are best suited for simple projects or performances. They give a quick snapshot or overview of quality. They rate the entire project activity or performance. They provide a single score on all criteria. Um, so in other words, all criteria are evaluated simultaneously. It combines all important elements of the project or performance, and it's useful for summative or large scale assessment. Some considerations to be aware of with holistic rubrics, there's no analysis of strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and there's no feedback to guide improvement, so it might not be useful for formative assessment, in other words. So here's an example of a holistic rubric. So one, two, or three points are awarded for the number of sources the student included. In contrast, the number of sources is considered along with historical accuracy um, and the other criteria in the use of the holistic rubric to arrive at a more global impression of the student's work. So we can see the student's going to have three points if they list 10 or more sources, include no historical accuracies, clearly indicated from which sources information was drawn, provided all relevant information. So we've got four different criteria here. We've got a holistic view of what student work would look like at, at an uh, exemplary level. And then we've got competent, we've got deficient. And you can have more levels in a holistic rubric as well. A uh, task-specific rubric, I won't spend too much time on, but it provides detailed guidance for a single task. Uh, it provides for consistent scoring. It identifies what students know, facts, procedures, methods, equations. Um, but it might be difficult to develop a new rubric for each task. So that's just one example of a task-specific rubric. And I can send um, more examples of all of these different types of rubrics. I'll send a bunch of different examples in my uh, post-workshop email. Uh, a general rubric may lead to standardized judgment where a set of criteria used for broader assessment. Um, so a general rubric can be used across similar performances or projects. So in other words, um, all similar projects or presentations, and you'd use a single general rubric. It also enables students to see the bigger picture and it reduces development time because you're just using one rubric across assessments. Um, one con might be that the feedback might be too general in a general rubric. So there isn't any differentiation between different uh, assessments. All right, just kind of trying to fly through here um, to developing a rubric. So the first thing you wanna do is select the task select an authentic task to assess. You want to identify ways that students can demonstrate that they meet goals and objectives. We want to avoid inessential expectations. We want to replicate meaningful tasks found in the real world, and we want to encourage students to problem solve and to apply their knowledge. Uh, we want to make sure that our rubric relates to the outcomes that are being measured. So it should match the learning goals and objectives that we have for that assessment. It should also address all aspects of the outcomes being measured. It shouldn't address anything extraneous. So for example, um, as I mentioned before, spelling and grammar might be considered extraneous on a science assessment, depending on the assessment, unless it's measuring an outcome that deals specifically with communication. So perhaps, you know, a science report or they have to write a mock journal article. Um, Select a task that may be difficult to grade when you want to remove subjectivity, and the task will better assist students in understanding those, their performance expectations. The second step is to determine your criteria. You want to find out what the dimensions, the criteria, the traits of the assignment are. So one way that you can do that is to list the details of the task. What do you want to assess or measure in your student's performance? And then think about the standards of excellence or the competencies that you want students to have. <clears throat> 
Um, step three is chunking. So we want to group or chunk similar dimensions from step two and try to start categorizing those dimensions into criteria. We want to, again, limit those categories to a manageable list of criteria and then add details within those criteria categories. Our fourth step is to set those levels. And we've seen this graphic before. Um, identify those potential gradations of quality. Sometimes you might just use a numerical value instead of a label. So let's say you're not weighting your grades. It's just 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 points. And maybe those are your levels, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Or maybe you want to, to label them. Um, differences between levels can be difficult to distinguish as you add more levels of performance. So start off with the fewest that you think you need. And if you need to add one, you can go ahead and do that. <clears throat> And then also distinguish between work that does or doesn't meet the criteria. So what's the highest level of performance? What's the lowest level of performance? Uh, and then you can kind of fill in the middle there. It's uh, sometimes difficult to make those finer distinctions, which is why we don't want to have too many levels. Um, and it, you want to also try to avoid absolute language. That's where you can kind of box yourself in. So never always um you know maybe something in, in the middle there mostly sometimes um you know try to give yourself some room next you'll write your descriptors so you've got your criteria along the left side you've got your level of performance along the top and then we just need to fill in the rest uh, write appropriate descriptions for each performance level explain what it looks like what does performance look like at that level for that criteria? What's the depth, the breadth, the quality, the scope, the extent, the complexity, the degree, the accuracy? Um, include indicators for each level, major to minor, consistent to inconsistent, uh, rarely to mostly. And subsequent descriptions typically incorporate or echo previous descriptions. So I start with the highest level and then what does one step below that look like? And then I echo what I've said in the higher level, but make some adjustments for what might be missing in the, the level below it that caused that student to be at uh, maybe a proficient level instead of an exemplary level. And then I work my way down from there. Now, once you've got the descriptors, uh, you want to determine your score values. Identify the maximum number of points for achieving the highest level of quality assign a number to each of the lower levels. And gradations should make sense mathematically depending on the total number of points available, the number of criteria, the number of performance levels. <clears throat> so you want to make sure that um, when you use the rubric and you're grading uh, students' work, that those numbers come out correctly or the way that you intended. So as I mentioned, you want to try it out. So after you've got your rubric, test it out. Compare an initial score without the rubric to one you would give with the rubric. Or review it with a colleague. Or you could also use it in class. Um, you know, have students look at it and solicit their feedback uh, or their input prior to implementing it. Um, or take some student work from a previous semester that you didn't use a rubric to grade. Grade it using this rubric and see how it works out and then revise as necessary. Some considerations when you're creating or selecting a rubric, does the rubric align with your outcomes or your objectives? So remember our assessments are assessing whether students are meeting our course objectives. So which course objectives are you assessing? How can you create your criteria so that it supports or aligns with those actions or objectives? Uh, does the rubric include performance levels? And are those performance levels clear? Or what they mean. Do criteria reflect current notions of excellence in your field? Are your scores well defined? Is the rubric as fair and bias free as it can be? Does it re allow for inter-rater reliability? So if someone else were to use this rubric to grade the same assignment, would they get the same or roughly the same score? And finally, is the rubric useful, practical, and manageable? <clears throat> 
So what can rubrics do for you and your students? Um, they can function as an instructional and an evaluation tool. They can facilitate timely feedback on student work. So if it's um, quicker for you to provide feedback, the quicker it is, the sooner your students get that feedback and can apply that to their learning. It can also refine our teaching by better organizing and defining our expectations. It can facilitate communication between us and our students. It can prepare and guide students' work, and it can assess student work individually and as a whole. Ultimately, rubrics promote meaningful assessment and evaluation. So I've got a few resources <clears throat> on our, our website um, that I want to point out to you. And I will drop these in the chat, too. We've got a blog post that was written by a former um, member of what was formerly faculty development um, on rubrics. So you, if you were interested in that, you can take a look at that blog entry. And we also have some tutorials. We have a tutorial on interactive rubrics in Blackboard and Original Course View. So if you're using Original Course View, that should be useful. And I'll drop that in our chat as well. And then we also have um, a video tutorial on creating rubrics in Blackboard Ultra Course View. I'll put that in the chat too. And then a couple more uh, Ultra Course View tutorials here that I think uh, are useful. Um, how to associate a rubric. That's that first one. And how to grade using a rubric in Ultra. And we also have those resources for Original Course View too. They're available on our website. Um, so I'm going to send you some worksheets as well. There will be um, a checklist for rubric development um, and a couple of, of worksheets, some, some rubric templates, a holistic rubric template, an analytic rubric template to get you started, um, and then some other handouts as well that I'll send, including some um, Association of American Colleges and Universities value rubrics. Uh, they're valid assessment of learning and undergraduate education. Uh, so there's different rubrics that they have uh, that are really useful, especially for assessments that you wouldn't necessarily think of using a rubric for. So I'll send you those in my follow-up email. And then I'll also send you this list of resources, uh, references and resources. So there's some there. And then there's some rubric-specific resources, too, um, some online resources of free rubric samples, a uh, rubric builder where you can build rubrics or edit other rubrics to use. Um, so there's a, a few of those there. Our campus, Rubistar, uh, Teachnology, and the rubric builder. So I wanted to make sure that I have some time at the end if there, you have any questions. Kind of flew through some information there. Um, but like I said, I'll, I'll get you those resources uh, later today once I can get them compiled into an email for you. But if anybody has any questions, you can share your audio or you can drop them in the chat. No problem. Quick question, Amanda. And this is yeah. maybe a little embarrassing to ask. But so I I use rubrics in grading, but I can see mm -hmm. now after going through this that there's definitely some things that I could change up. <laughs> like what's best practice about like I've already used, you know, a rubric for an assignment. What's the best practice on is it okay to then change that up for the next assignment? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean Okay. As long as you tell students, yep. hey, I'm changing the rubric, this yep. is the rubric, you know, for the next assignment before they've done the assignment, yeah. um, that's totally fine. Yeah, you can, I, I make those adjustments all the time. Okay. I figured, but also just wanted to check. Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah, totally. And I've gotten that question before too. So it's a common question. But yeah, you can definitely change your rubric as long as you're not changing it, um, you know, after you've already given it to students, they've already submitted their work and then you can't change it at that point because you've already told them this is how I'm going to be assessing your work. Yeah. But, you know, for f go ahead. No, I was just going to say, yeah, Daryl put in a good question. Some folks use rubrics <clears throat> but don't pre-share them with students. Um, yeah, so, but it's one thing if I've already shared a rubric. But <laughs> right, yeah, and I, I always share the rubric with my students. So when I use uh, Blackboard interactive rubrics and I always check, you know, show students the rubric, show students the scores, um, because if you don't, check those boxes, they won't be able to see them when you grade their work either. So they won't be able to see the breakdown of why they got their grade after they were graded either. So um, I always do that. And why wouldn't you want your students to know how they're going to be graded? Like it shouldn't be a surprise or it shouldn't be a mystery, how, you know, what they're supposed to be doing on an assignment or, you know, so I don't see why you wouldn't share the rubric with your students um, unless you haven't created it yet before you've given them the assignment but it should be based on the criteria that's outlined in you know an assignment sheet or so they should know in some way how they're going to be graded um, but yes you can change the rubric as long as um, you're changing it um, and it's not inconsistent with what you've told students they're, how how you've told students they're going to be graded on a particular assessment Yeah, I'm all for sharing that grading rubric with students. And showing them how they can find that information too. It's not always um, necessarily intuitive how they can look at or find the rubric uh, that they're gonna be graded on before they submit their assignment. Any other questions? I'm good. Thank you very much. This has been a great session. Great. Thanks. I'm glad you found it helpful. You're welcome. All right. Well, thank you for attending and participating today um, and for sharing your experiences with everybody as well. Um, and like I said, I will send you that follow up email at some point today with uh, those resources that I promised you and have a great rest of your week.